Hey there, guys. It's your boy, AMG Tafosi Dent. New, uh, new ring off for you there. But uh, welcome to our podcast and our channel. This is the Stripping the Dipping podcast channel. We're bringing you this episode live and uh, raw with all the energy, all the drama, all the speculative talking points you can expect on a great most sport show itself. Listen, I'm very excited because uh, we've had the Australian Grand Prix this weekend just gone by. There was lots of talking points throughout the week, which me and our very special guests will talk about. And on top of which, I'm really gassed and super excited to have this gentleman on because, you know, he's such a legend in his scene. He's done so well for himself in terms of being one of the biggest DJs and music producers out there also has a really banging show if you're into your supercars you would definitely yeah. want to go and check out his social media profile because man he has the exotics on tap so guys give us a very warm welcome for our guest today tommy music in the building tommy how's it going man hello um all good thank you very much how are you doing bro always excited to have you on man like it's been such an awesome kind of start to the year everything's kind of kicking into gear you know on, in the world of motorsport there's been so much going on with just the formula one the red bull yeah. stories lewis's <laughs> big move which i don't think we've had the opportunity to talk about so far and just generally this there's, there's, there's been a, a story i feel for every single race weekend we've had so far man so definitely yeah. going to chop it up on the formula one stuff but more importantly bro as we talk to the first we go through the first kind of talking point bro just how have you been man what are the latest things you've been working on and for our new listeners there'll always be new people that come in and have curiosity about the show give them a light introduction into the amazing stuff that yes. you do um so my name is tommy i am a uh, car enthusiast car collector um music producer uh, dj uh, but now i focus on more automotive related things i'm a massive formula one fan i've been a formula one fan since 2005 uh, so i've pretty much been around around for a while now um there's people that will obviously have been there longer but i like to think that i'm well educated on the subject matter uh, I'm a Lewis Hamilton fan, as you could probably tell by the color of my skin. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> tell them. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's facts though. But uh, yeah, massive Lewis Hamilton fan. He really uh, inspired me a lot growing up and seeing someone that looked like me, um, who had a similar complexion, who, uh, you know, has had to face similar barriers throughout life. Seeing someone like that achieve so much in Formula One has always been something that's really uh, been like a, a beacon for me. Uh, Sure. And it's always inspired me. I've always loved cars since I was young. So being able to see that on TV has been amazing. Um, other than that, I'm pretty much here. I'm a, uh, I would say a new father. My son's going to be one soon, Aww. so I'm not that much of a new father. So um, I'm <laughs> constantly tired. That's another part that would go in my bio or this talking, uh, this, this, this section of the, of, of the podcast. Um, but other than that, um, I'm great. <laughs> Oh, we're so happy to hear that, man. And like you mentioned, you know, exciting times for everybody, bro. Just so happy as well. You know, you've got a new life in the world. You know, I imagine the challenges and adventures of fatherhood are ones that on a day-to-day -day basis you're exploring, which is amazing yeah. to hear. And it's great. Oh, bro. That, uh, uh, guys, it's the best thing you'll ever do. <laughs> like, go ahead and do, just bang them out <laughs> as many as you yeah, can. Yeah, appropriate. Do it sooner rather than later. <laughs> Yeah. That's what I would I'm, say. <laughs> fair, fair point, man. And, you know, in relation to just following the sport as well, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to follow the GOAT in terms of just how much he's achieved in the time of space? He's been in Formula One. The, you know, the records, the barriers he's helped move that seemed immovable. Yeah. And generally as well, he's such a, such a cool individual in terms of his uh, exploits on and off the circuit. And, you know, bro, I wanted to ask you, before we even get into the first kind of like Grand Prix related question, Lewis, to the Scuderia Ferrari, man. What was your take on that and being yeah, a, a supercar a enthusiast true. yourself? Yeah, dream I can come imagine. True. I'll tell you why it's a dream come <laughs> true. Now I can rock my Ferraris with pride. Before I used to feel slightly ashamed because I'm a massive fan. <laughs> but now, uh, I yeah, I'm a full Tifosi gentleman now. So, no, honestly, I think um, the most iconic uh, Formula One driver in modern history and arguably of all time going to the most iconic team the undone undeniably the most iconic formula one team of all time it's a match made in heaven i think from a marketing standpoint it's incredible from a performance standpoint it's also incredible you know um 
other than Red Bull, Ferrari has been like the forefront of this new generation of cars. So it'd be nice mm -hmm. to see someone with such um, a success and such renowned driving ability going to that team. Um, and also red is just a sexy color, man. So yeah, I'm, I'm fully <laughs> involved. I'm fully invested. It is nice that um, already there's been changes happening at um, Ferrari, uh, you know, just based off this Lewis Hamilton uh, move. I think Fred has um, really created an environment that has uh, just like um, bred positivity. So I look forward to seeing Lewis Hamilton become part of that. As we know, they have history from uh, before Formula One. So it's, it's mm -hmm. looking like a match made in heaven. I don't want to speak too soon, but I feel like he could potentially be the next Ferrari champion. And that for me would just be the icing on the cake. And I think Absolutely. not only can he be safely retired from Formula One, I may just safely retire from Formula One. <laughs> just, you know, just go out on a high, never feel disappointed, <laughs> never have to wake up early on Sundays again, just to enjoy it from there. Well, bro, you know the saying, man, always it's great to leave on a high. And you mentioned as yeah. well, like, structurally for Ferrari, it's such a boss move from them to put Lewis inside their corporation to see them mm -hmm. grow as, you know, Ferrari themselves, they're the company that, don't have adverts on TV because their legacy and this, their uh, brand is so widespread and well-recognized amongst so many different yes. factions of motorsport, yeah. culture, music, fashion. You know, this is amazing. And like Migsy said here, shout out to Migsy, shout out to Colin, and shout out to Georgina for tuning in already. Everyone's a Ferrari fan. I can't lie. I can't yeah. even deny that. You know, I've got it's my true. little Schumacher collectible box here. And yeah. just generally, um, you know, like I think all of us at some point would have fell in love with uh, the woman wearing the red lipstick. I know you're a married man yeah. now, Tommy, so <laughs> I'll leave that one there. But, I'm a, yeah, I'm a happily married man. <laughs> exactly. Let's put that out there too. But for yeah. sure, like, um, it, it's a great move. And I think for the sport as well, kind of what we need because it's going to create such a domino effect in the driver market, which is also another yes. talking point we'll discuss mm -hmm. as this podcast goes on. So I further ado. Let's get into our first Grand Prix topic of the weekend. So, you know, we're going back to Australia, Mike. Foster's beer. And, uh, you know, lo and Australia. behold, going down Australia, Mike. And, <laughs> you know, down under, many things can happen. And, you, lo you know, lo and behold, first practice session alone, uh, Alex Alban goes out there in his Williams, makes quite a very copycat image of um, a mistake he made in the previous Grand Prix year at uh, Melbourne at Albert Park completely writes off the chassis like you know a drunk driver mm. trying to come home <laughs> from a night out madness thing and uh you know it puts james vows the new team principal valtteri it's james uh in a mm. sticky predicament because yeah. the team unfortunately have been in a position where you know they've been blessed with new investors they've got new owners they're trying to restructure themselves and try to replicate, you know, the uh, the image of what they were back in the 80s, 70s, 90s with the likes, you know, of, uh, you know, Alan Jones. Senna, unfortunately, had his timely passing there. But, you know, Prost, um, the great Pastor Maldonado, show some love to my South American goat there too. Mm -hmm. Last mm -hmm. winner for, for William. I know Tommy's looking like, bro, don't remind me because Valencia oh, 2012 God. also mm -hmm. rubbed Lewis over. But listen folklore history nonetheless and ever since 2012 tommy like like uh you know like a guy that has serious judge just on it on his life williams have been stuck in the mud haven't really progressed yeah. in the in a hybrid era they've yeah. tried to get a new lease of life but then adopted this kind of metric where they keep one generational driver of such and one pay driver to pay the bills and you're in a sticky situ situation now where essentially you have a car that's been completely written off. You don't have any spare chassis, which to me in a professional kind of sport, yeah, like Formula that's... One is an absolute madness to me. But anyways, um, they're in a moral compass dilemma where they have to take the car from the backup driver, backup dancer, and give that car to the man who crashed his car, which creates this predicament to begin with so morally um strategically let me say with, with my thinking hat on obvious decision you've got a driver which is more informed yeah. he's kind of had his own 
like recovery and renaissance in a sense of not fitting in so well at Red Bull, but then finding a new lease of life somewhere else and being able to yeah. perform and nick those points on occasions. For a team that needs those points more than ever now, it would make sense to put him in the car, to give him that opportunity. Yeah. Morally, however, though, James Vowles has come out, he's adopted this new role of being team principal. One of the, thing, of the things that did gripe me is he is a team principal that does the PG thing and comes out and says, you know, oh, our boy Logan, you know, he's learning, he's making progress. Yeah. We, as Williams, fully back and support our driver. No, 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 don't give us any of this, like, driver market talk. He's here to stay. And in a moment where you think they would back their driver, potentially, yeah. they haven't. And I could only imagine, whether you love, hate, or respect Logan Sargent as an individual, as an athlete, how soul-crushing that must be for his confidence, his self-esteem, mm. and also this his position in the team. Because bear in mind now, there'll be contract negotiations. Yeah. He's probably the one bringing a bit of money into the team to help steady the ship. And now that you've got American investors, he's kind of, I guess, the token driver mm -hmm. to represent yeah. that. I can't imagine in Williams although they came to that consensus, that everybody would have been fully on board. So before I even go into the comments, Tommy, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think at the end of the day, Formula One isn't like you're there to win races. You're there to perform. You're not there to spare anyone's feelings. It's a cold-blooded move, but sorry, just had to be done. Um, Logan Sargent's track record hasn't showed that he, he has what it takes to perform. Um, at the end of the day, if I had to say... You know, between Logan Sargent and Alex Albon, um, your life, my life is at risk unless one of them score points. I will put my life safely in Alex Albon's hands because I just wouldn't, like, historically, I'm, there's nothing against Logan. He's just not good enough, unfortunately. And I think, you know, these tough decisions have to be made. That's why uh, you have team principles and that's why they made the decision. I think everyone crying about it. Um, and everyone complain about it, they need to stop seeing it from an emotion standpoint. At the end of the day, this is business and mm -hmm. this is a sport. It's not saving anyone's feelings. That's like saying, oh, you know what? We're England, we're in the four by 100 meter relay. Someone's dropped out because they pulled their, uh, you know, their calf or something. We need to get mm -hmm. someone else in to run. You're not going to be like, oh, we should get the guy that's never run before because, you know, he's he's probably waiting for his opportunity. No, you just get whoever's going to be the fastest. And in this scenario, it was Alex Albon. So it is what it is. And yeah, that's it. I, like, I, I think Williams, another note, uh, Williams have an archaic way of doing things. And I think it's now starting to embarrass them and show up more and more. Obviously, James has gone in there and he's uh, altered a lot. Uh, I was reading that apparently Williams were designing and doing everything to do with their cars via Microsoft Excel, which is embarrassing. Um, so <laughs> on these Excel spreadsheets that they had, um, <laughs> it's true. And on these uh, Excel spreadsheets we have, um, they didn't have the location of parts. They didn't have um how many they had they didn't have any of that other information on there so um it, it just goes to show that they just not cut out to be a formula one team at this point but james is changing stuff and this tough decision is a decision that had to be made and i think is to me i put more respect on his name because at the end of the day it is what it is you know mm -hmm. i hear that bro listen the spreadsheets weren't spreading pause but um yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I get it. Logically, and, you know, we've got our um, our Formula One historian, a motorsport historian, yeah. Colin Johnson in the building. Yeah. Put some respect on his name as well. I agree from the logical point of view. Obviously, you have to, it's dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. It's a competition at the end of the day. And there have been people at Williams, to be fair, in the, in the past, like, you know, Frank, um, obviously, Frank Williams and Patrick Head, which would have made even more cutthroat decisions Back then, I, I remember there's a story about Patrick Head saying that he felt Jensen Button wasn't ready for Formula One when Jensen burst onto the scene. So, uh, you know, I hear that, obviously, as well. Black saying, Tommy, on his business, stand on business, man, <laughs> and, which is facts. And then, um, yeah, just Georgina saying, ironically, James is a better uh, as a team principal so far, which we agree with. 
Colin saying that you know the Williams project needs time and money, and uh, more than money, it just needs time. Uh, no more than time. Sorry, it just needs money because mm -hmm. they are so backwards in the way they do things. Like there was parts on the car that other teams make out of carbon fiber and should have been carbon fiber, but Williams were making out of metal. There are <laughs> things that they have refused to change due to them being stuck in the mentality of the like the old ways. And what it's meant is that now uh, James and uh, I can't remember the name of the other guy, but they've gone in there and they've been like, D Williams is 20 years behind every other Formula One team in the way it runs things. And it goes to show because uh, 20 years ago, Williams was performing. Um, mm -hmm. When we look at the, the last win, when was the last win? 2012, was it? 2012, Pastor Martin, uh, bro, I said it. Pastor yeah. Maldonado. <laughs> So <laughs> that, that, was not in that was 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 hey in, man the history uh, the history books when you look back <laughs> you can see that they they they've got a lot of changing and a lot of issues that they need to resolve so yeah uh, mm. man I don't know I don't know for um I don't know for I don't know for Williams I don't know for well Williams, I, I was gonna I jump in there as well they made the right decision <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, obviously, strategically, you can't argue it. Unfortunately for Logan, you know, he's had a season and a bit there. He's not really set the world on fire. And not every driver has to do that. But even if you look at Alain Stroll, which is in a very privileged position, even on his best day, you know, you know the saying, a clock strikes twice, right? Even he's been able to mm. nab out a pole position here or get yeah. uh, a podium there. With Logan, I can't see it. And that's kind of why I'm almost as angry at Williams, too, for bringing the guy in initially. Because when you see the raft of talent, Tommy, in F2 and other world sporting series as well, for Williams to go from the likes of having Senna, Prost, Ralph Schutler, I don't really rate Ralph that much, but Montoya. And now we're dealing with the likes of De Resta, um logan mm. uh i'm gonna put respect on qubits's name because version version one like uh, ios version one qubits was was cold but when he came back I, I don't think he was the same driver but to see the decline in the team was just crazy you know and like Mixy said here yeah. they're still in the past like their steering wheel which again is mad to me yeah, how, how you know wheel. tommy bro even man yeah. like AMG Tafosi Dens got the steering wheel with the dashboard on there, yeah. fam. It's crazy. It's crazy out here, fam. I'm going to have to rest that in the corner carefully before I go over my budget. But yeah, yeah. I think we, we you know, it, it's, it's, it's a fair point. I think for Williams, everybody loves to see the underdog do better. Williams are not a manufacturer. They're a privateer team. So to see, you know, the likes of um, David go up against Goliath, it's always amazing storyline and one where I think the low William fans will back them to the hills and back. Yeah, but, but we have to we have to rethink yeah. like they shouldn't be there because they are world championship winning team, like historically. Mm -hmm. And due to mismanagement and a uh, stubbornness to change, it's put them in this situation. Personally, mm -hmm. I think if that's what it is, they just need to they need to suck it up. But James did say, look, 2023 is going to be tough for us. They had a tough winter. They spent a lot on infrastructure, changing things. So that they say, and hopefully this will change things going forward. I visited Williams once and even I could tell that they, it was a bit it was a bit like dated in the way they do stuff. Mm. The only thing is they're, they're very nice there. And Williams is a very nice and pleasant wholesome team but at the end of the day that wholesome doesn't win um doesn't win points and um that's why i think it was great that they put alex in that car because again being wholesome doesn't win points true true nice guys finish last that's the that's the exactly. saying you know so um definitely yo junior in the building what's up my guy thank you so much for joining us on this channel really appreciate you man we're gonna get into the next topic now w15 woes um i wasn't running through the six with my woes tommy I instead i was <laughs> looking at uh, you know a mercedes double double dnf which mm. is outlandish to me lewis with the engine failure really unfortunate and then on top of that as well um well george woody and uh uncle alonso which i'm gonna talk about later on in the show so stick around guys we're gonna talk about the debate of brake check or not to brake test but 
Yeah. Tommy, you know, I mean, I guess we already actually talked about, you know, in terms of Lewis making his move from Mercedes. Yeah. And I think a lot of people were surprised because Lewis is seen as basically an ambassador figure of AMG, of a well, they don't seem of like that, Mercedes. Do they? They, they mm, don't well, seem like that. And that's part of the reason he moved that not making him an ambassador of the brand is delusional. But if we look at Mercedes now, even in the automotive mm-hmm. world, the mistakes that they're making are comical because for example, C63 AMG renowned is like Mercedes muscle car, um, muscle car, the last version, four liter, um, turbocharged V8. Um, and now Mercedes has decided to make it a four cylinder, uh, two liter engine. So no one's bought it. There are a total of um, two that have been sold in the UK. And if you go on Auto Trader, there are two for sale. So no one wants them. Um, they've realized it was a big mistake. And yet they continue to um, put their heels in or dig their heels in and say that they're going forward with this hybrid future that for, for performance cars that no one wants. Um, and they've also made the same similar mistake with the Mercedes SL where the car weighs too much. The AMG GT replacement, the same thing. So there's something happening at a high level in Mercedes where there's a disconnect between what will benefit the company and what is financially uh, beneficial for them. So they're thinking, mm-hmm. you know, what, if we make this two liter engine, we have to spend less on infrastructure, spend less on development. We also get our credits for emissions. And thus they think making this car will be good, but making this car isn't good for you if no one buys it. And it's the same thing with Lewis Hamilton. They wanted to save money and they wanted to, you know, uh, invest in this Lewis Hamilton list future, which has instead caused them a massive uh, issue now because their star driver, their brand has left essentially. Um, and they continue to make bad cars. Uh, this is the third year, fourth year, fourth, third. It's the third year that they've made a terrible Well, car. in 2021 as well, also, I don't think they get much leeway, Tommy, because you had that rule yeah, which changed the floor. 2021, they, they got outdeveloped by Red Bull because they were investing mm. in this terrible car that they continue car. to bring. And, you know, it, it shows that they do not value or they do not appreciate what they had in Lewis Hampton because he was saying, change the car, change the car, change the car. And they again, they dug their heels in. And now we're stuck with the car that is basically them relearning everything that they've learned from the w14 and the w13 which was a race winner by the way it won a race um they're relearning everything now because they've changed their philosophy completely changed the car obviously components are still carried over but ultimately they are starting on the back foot and um yeah it's it's kicking them in the ass right now but what can we say we don't own the team well, and Tommy, this this kind of comes on to my next point, bro, about, you know, you hit the nail on their head, like, you just sautéed it like Salt Bay, because, mm-hmm. you know, people have started to look now, not only just in terms of, obviously, the aero department, the simulation department, the power unit department, because, you know, it's amazing that even though they own their own V6 hybrid engine, they're getting outperformed by their customer teams, which is mad to me. Yeah. But more so, the structural point of view of, is Toto still fit? Obviously, we know Toto has like a big share in the Mercedes F1 team itself. Mercedes in the whole is owned by the, D- the Daimler board too, which you mentioned there could be a lot of disconnect there from the F1 team mm-hmm. to the people that own the parent company, the parent company yeah. to the road consumers like yourself and I, you know, which would buy the product if it was worthy of being bought mm. but yeah toto's um behaviors recently have been under a lot of um scrutiny he's obviously come out and said that lewis was rushing him which i don't quite buy he's also kind of put his fishing rod out there and said that you know it, it would either come down to Kimi antonelli the future of mercedes or you know potentially seeing if he could get in bed with the ops max dutch boy mm. verstappen <laughs> um what are your comments on that too man uh, I think, you know, when you're down and when you're not winning, people will, you know, highlight things. These are things that have been going on for years. No one was complaining when they were winning. I think it's just one of those things. I don't think he's not fit to run the team. At the end of the day, he has an interest in the team and he wants to make money. So I don't think, again, he's unfit of running the team. But I just think we're just being more aware of mistakes and mishaps that are happening now that they're not winning. Because you can let mistakes happen. You can let 
uh, phrases slip up, slip under the radar when the team is performing, when the team is winning. But now, um, I think we're just very aware of everything going on and we're very hypercritical. I think ultimately, if we look at it, Mercedes actually performed well in the standings last year. Uh, they got the points. Lewis Lewis got the points to, that he needed last year. He did really well and not a great car. And things may have been different if Red Bull wasn't in the race. Um, he could have been a championship winner, but it's just, it's the way it goes. And look, at the end of the day, sport ebb and flows. Uh, the Chicago Bulls went, you know, the best team in the world forever. Mercedes won't be the best team in the world forever. Look at Williams that we've already discussed. Ferrari. Um, it's just the way things are you know uh, mm -hmm. red bulls having their moment now is not going to be forever but um yeah i don't know i don't know i i, I think toto wolf is still a good team principal out of everyone on the grid i think he's still top three top four um i just think now we're hypercritical about everything he says and everything he does and i think the mercedes team unfortunately are going to be under this uh, magnifying glass until they uh they start to perform again and i'm not sure when that's going to be because it's looking like this year again another write-off and it's just we're here for just because we have to be um which is a shame but it makes my life better because i now no longer wake up early on sunday mornings because i'm <laughs> excited to see a race i just blase tune in halfway and watch it from there uh, mm -hmm. I am a Lewis Hamilton fan. I will say if Lewis Hamilton wasn't in sport, I probably wouldn't continue watching the sport. Uh, and I think that uh, sentiment goes to a lot of Mercedes fans. Um, and now that he's not able to compete, it's making it very difficult to be invested in the sport. And that is just, uh, again, amplified by the fact that Red Bull had this like complete dominance race after race after race after race. And it's just becoming a drag. I think if there was fighting between two teams, I would be interested. Mm. But right now, Formula One feels more like a chore than it does something I enjoy, which yeah. is sad. But I'm yeah, it says a lot. Say I'm a fake F1 fan, but I'm gonna be real. I love Formula One. I just like Lewis Hamilton more. So <laughs> fair, bro. And you know, I like that you just wear it on your sleeve, man. Because I feel yeah. everybody's entitled to follow who they want, and at the same time, as well. People can make comparisons between, oh, well, you know, yeah. you Team LH fans are better. Oh, when, when Lewis was winning, you, you weren't as angry. But the thing is, is that I think you can draw distinctions between Lewis's reign of dominance in, in Formula One, where at least you had a, a Sebastian Vettel. The Red Bulls on a good day could still give you a challenge. You know, there yeah. still was a storyline. And Lewis gave us so many wins, bro, in so many different facets. Man could win a race mm. at Silverstone on three tires. Man could win a race from the back of the grid in Brazil. You know, and work his way yeah. through progressively that at Grand Prix. That was a good race, man. That was a really Sensation. good race. Yeah. Sensation. Sensation. 2021 was like peak Formula One, man. That was like peak yeah. Formula One. Until everything was perfect. Even though it, was, even though it wasn't perfect and it was chaotic and there was a lot of like dirty tactics going on, it was just the perfect season until, until... the last lap of the last race. And that just ruined mm. it because that could have gone down as the greatest his the History. greatest um in history, it could have gone down as the greatest season of all time. But unfortunately, it's now known as the tainted season. But anyway, yeah. we've probably spoken about that before. So um, sure. moving on. Yeah. <laughs> moving on. Right. So, well, well one team is uh, on the decline. Uh, yes. There is another team which is in ascendancy. And Thank God. It's up this team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh. I Man. have always been, I've always been a Ferrari fan. Seeing them. Mm -hmm being able to win races now this is two races that uh, they've won in recent history uh, so i don't know i think at least someone else is winning um I, carlos signs being the one to win i guess no one thought that was going to happen or otherwise he would have stayed at the team but it is what it is and it's nice to see that um uh it's nice to see that they they're, they're performing and they're doing better I like it. I like what Fred's doing with the team. I like the mentality they're taking to everything. It seems way more chill, way more relaxed, less less up itself. It just seems like they've just kind of like the pressure's backed off. I still know it's like the most high pressure team to be in. But at the same time, I, I love what Ferrari are doing right now. I love it. Yep, same here as well, man. It just feels like a good camp, good vibe, like you mentioned. And more on an individual point as well there, Tommy empathetic recovery from Carlos Sainz appendicitis two weeks ago 
and man's back yeah. mashing work in an F1 car, driving for his I rate life. It. I rate it. You know? I rate it. I rate it. I think it's it's it's, it's good. It's inspiration. I think now that the pressure's off of him as well, because he knows he's not going to be there next year. He's kind of just mm -hmm. like just relaxed a bit more. Like it's, he seems more just like at one with the car and less worried about the politics of the team and stuff. I think what I really want to see this year is a Charles win. I really feel like he needs it for his performance and his like his belief in his his self because he seems like someone that doubts himself a lot. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy. I'm ha I'm happy with what what Ferrari's doing. Same here, man. Like you know, just to see the storyline, like you mentioned, and for Charles too, I'd like to see him do just as well as well because you know he is Ferrari's prodigy child i think just to see that they've always believed in him they've invested yeah. into his junior career he's done those years at salba he's come up into the you know the works factory team and then yeah. put licks on sebastian vettel as well whether people want to criticize whether sebastian was at his peak or not at that stage still not an easy feat you know and mm. he's just such a likable character as well we we have time for charles on here so for yeah. sure it's yeah. great to see that energy I I like him. Mm -hmm. He's young. He's got many years ahead of him, but I feel like he needs a few wins just to feel better about himself. When was the last mm -hmm. Charles win? 2021? 2022. It, it, too. it would have been in that year where Ferrari in had... Yes, yes, yes. When when the new mm -hmm. regs came in and Ferrari were up there with Red Bull for the first few races, they, he won in Bahrain. And that was nice to see. So, yeah, yeah. up to, is what it is. It is what it is true one of those things man one of those things well you know another team which to be fair are doing better than mercedes it's not a high bar these days to really beat you know is uh mclaren, McLaren which yes. also i know as a supercar enthusiast you would have driven a couple of 720s a couple of 650s a uh, couple of <laughs> mclaren centers but um yeah. no keeping it on the f1 side of things um bro mclaren again decent result Lando kind of being Lando and getting, I guess, the most he could. Piastri as well, making that step from a rookie kind of more yeah. into the world yeah. of like being on the pace. Um, there was an interesting kind of dynamic in the race where we've seen team orders deployed again for the second week in a row now. And uh, well, at that kind of point, they we were telling um, Piastri to give the track position to Lando. Lando tried to take that fight to Leclerc, but just it didn't really uh, turn into yeah. fruition. You know, is it is it early for um you know these teams to be making those kind of calls on like strategy? It's I know, very, obviously, now early. we're talking about mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's very early for a driver like Piastri as well, being so young. You know, do you think it's a thing where McLaren need to be mindful not to like pull the trigger? on that button all the time because we've seen it even in teams like Red Bull where, uh, you know, you had a dynamic between Mark Webber and Sebastian Vettel mm -hmm. and there were times where they, they would try and kind of help each other. But then yeah. at one point, you know, everybody wants to beat their team here at the end of the day. Everybody wants to yeah. be the top dog in the team. And ultimately, by you trying to contrive the strategy to get one outcome and not getting that outcome, the backlash of that outcome could be much broader in its, in its effect. So, yeah, yeah. yeah Tommy, man, what, what's your take on that? Did they make the right call at the end of the day? You shocked not to see I them revert uh, the positions? I think there should just be no team orders at this current. It's, we're like, what, three races in? Why are, we, why are team orders a thing? Do you know what I mean? Let them just, let them, like, race. Like, I don't know. And then I guess if you're not taking the place and you can't, if you, if you do get team orders and you can't overtake, then just swap back like it's pretty simple uh mm. but yeah i guess every they there there are motivations behind everything um lando is their long-term driver so they want to keep him happy uh so yeah it is what it is but i'm not a massive fan of team orders unless it's you know guaranteeing points or guaranteeing someone gets something out of it like a championship or the, something else but i don't know yeah i agree with you man and it, I, like even just again from the emotional sent sentiment as well. Like Oscar could have had a podium in his home race and for him yeah. to actually get that accolade also, I feel would have been confidence building for him. So I agree with you from yeah. a from a point I where it, it just, they didn't. 
and then he also made the mistake to be fair as well he locked up the break and the gap was about yeah. four seconds i think and then it went up to eight by the end of the race so maybe he's just lacking that kind of finesse on the race pace side of things which you'll get i've got no kind of qualms about but yeah we've seen teams do it i think mercedes did it with valtteri and lewis in hungary where they made an agreement that lewis would yeah. overtake and then and you know he, he swap he, back if he can't get the pace in front yeah logically that's so, the sensible thing to do but yeah it, you know what it is what it is i'm kind of just fed up with formula one at this moment as you can tell by my blase attitude it seems like the, the <laughs> i love it though just like yeah it just i don't know it just seems like people are like you know what we're not winning the championship this year let's just we're here for the vibes uh mm. yeah i don't know mclaren mclaren has made an improvement in my eyes but i don't think that's necessary at this point in the season personally especially at someone's home race um yeah i don't colin said that the, the the swap gave them both a clean shot to maximize their race yeah i guess but i don't know man it just kind of sucks doesn't it but it, 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 like, yeah, <laughs> it is what it is i i it think is what it is because all i all i thought about for the australia race was damn this is an early start to uh, a race <laughs> and the second thing i thought about was damn lewis hamilton is no longer in the race uh, so um, my um, enthusiasm for this race and my knowledge memory is kind of just like down here because it was very, it was very early in the morning. But yes, mm. I hear you, bro. Like it's just one of those things. And hopefully, whilst I'm not gonna be too optimistic and try and gaslight us and say this is gonna be the most spectacular season ever, I'm hoping that yeah. there'll be a couple of more spanners and we'll see one or two anomalies that should spice up the results. We'll but... see. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. And in to- and, you know, on the topic of seeing stuff. Oh man, um, I thought they were amigos, Tommy. But no, no amigos no more between Uncle Alonso and uh and Russell here because uh yeah. you know the wily old fox they like to brand him did Russell a dirty one, and I'm not just yeah. talking about the dirty air either that man fell from 100 meters back in the breaking zone. This one really, really kicked off on social media, and there was a yeah. camp of professional racing drivers that also i guess grew up in the fernando alonso era where he started doing his kind of like you know pedantic stuff behind the wheel backing him you know and there were the russell fans which were like guys it's so dangerous and it was to be fair but then also some people demonstrated their knowledge too because they were saying the race should have been red flagged but either way by in tommy and you could fact check me on this as well if i'm wrong if they implement a virtual safety car Regardless whether it's a virtual safety car or a red flag, the drivers have to drive to the same delta anyway. It's not like there's a red flag and everyone stops yeah, on the circuit like ski electrics. Said, if they said if, if it if it was a red flag, he would have still been at risk by being on the track. Mm-hmm. I think what Russell was trying to do is he knew that if it was a red flag, red flag, his position, position, which ah. was it was I was like, damn, this guy's smart. <laughs> like to think about that straight away but at the same mm. time uh yeah why would you red flag on, on it was the last lap no why would you why would you yeah last lap why would you red flag the p- people are still driving um anyway they need to get off the track so yeah um you know what what fernando did i like to think of it this way if someone did that to me on a track or let's say even on a game I would be like this person's playing dirty mm. so with that mentality i know these are like the peak driving standards you know like these guys are experts they have lightning fast reaction times but when i think about it if someone did that to me i would be pissed because mm. you immediately put someone at massive risk do you know mm. what i mean I think uh, uh, they went through the data and Alonso lifting, punching the brakes, then getting back on the accelerator, like massively before the corner, shows what he was... I know what he's intending to do. You do it in karting, just to throw Mm. the person off behind you. They slow down, Mm. you gun it, and then you build a gap. You get... In this situation, he would have got out of DRS zone. But I think Mm -hmm. from what I understand of it, it was... A, it was a dangerous move. It was dangerous. There, it was dangerous. And I mm-hmm. think Alonso, you know, failing to, acknowledge, like when he made the statement straight afterwards, failing to acknowledge the fact that 
he it was nothing like how anyone has taken that corner or would take that corner failing to acknowledge that shows that his intent was to throw russell off but yeah i mm -hmm. guess it is what it is he got penalized for it um he got penalized for it i think right team so. didn't even appeal it you, why would you appeal and it? the team the data's there true. And they penalized mm -hmm. him off of data and you can't argue with data because every mm -hmm. lap of the race they know your breaking points they know your acceleration they know everything they may not know how much you break because that's just an on and off input but they can see mm -hmm. throttle inputs and everything and they said on this particular lap this particular section you did something irrational and unreasonable and it will mm -hmm. be like me going around a corner let's say let's pick a corner let's say uh the final turn of austria and then me lifting or not the final turn the one before the final turn you know the the fast right hander before the second right hander before the next right hander imagine i just lift off halfway through that corner I'll, i could kill someone like it doesn't like it's not a sensible thing to do and i think people are saying oh mm. yeah but you know what george should have known people don't realize when you're driving a car upsetting aerodynamic balance ups at, at those speeds not only aerodynamic balance but you also have your reactions are not going to be expecting this guy to break. Just like, look, see, he got a worse penalty than Max and Jeddah that says everything. Uh, we'll yeah, talk Max about that. that. That is, a, that is yeah, something Max I wanted to segue did into. did something equally as dangerous um, mm. or less dangerous because they were going a lot slower. But uh, yeah, I, I think it was dangerous. Uh, George could have got seriously hurt. It was, thank God he didn't, but that was a big crash. Mm. And now mm. a team's got to pay for the car, pay for the damage go through all these issues because someone thought what they were doing was being smart. It's obvious what he, he thought he was doing. It's so obvious. Mm. You do it You do it as a kid when you're playing um, uh, online on racing games. You do it as a kid when you're in cars. Bro, they do Lift it off early, now. <laughs> throw someone True. off. Mm. But yeah, you wouldn't do it now because you're an adult Like, and you you make sensible decisions. You're not desperate for a win to the point where you're going to risk someone's life and risk your points. But it is what it is. Mm. Alonso plays like that and he's always played like that. And then I think the funniest part of it is as soon as he did that afterwards, he was pretending like he had issues with his car because he knew what he did was wrong. He was pretending that the car was jerking and he was trying to act like, yeah, there's something wrong in the car. He knew what he did wrong. So I don't know, mm. man. I don't know. Yeah, well, I I'll kind of add to this as well. And, you know, like, whilst I still think Alonso was naughty, you knew what he was doing, like you said, Tommy. And to be fair as well, like, you know, like in this day and age of Formula One where the cars are so quick, something like yeah. that could have disastrous uh, re repercussions. And you don't want to see a fatality. You don't want to see that sort of thing because there'd be so much pressure on the FIA's head. I think where people bring in the debate is, like Black mentioned and like we've segued in a bit early there, is how comes FIA haven't proactively policed bad driving standards like that in the past? Because just off the top of my head, I could think about Alonso doing a similar thing to Checo in Brazil, but it was yeah. allowed different circuit though, so different scenarios. Yeah. I could I think of think... Hungary 2021, for example, where Lewis obviously was offset with that mistake or off strategy where he had to come through the field. And Alonso was trying to protect Ocon's position by mm. essentially doing the same thing, driving off the racing line, driving back on the racing line, squeezing Lewis off the circuit, lifting off yeah. the uh, gas into high-speed corners, blind corners in the second sector to throw Lewis off. And even Lewis back then said it was dangerous. Max Verstappen's yeah. driving standards as well, if you talk about him and uh, Mick Schumacher at Silverstone, where Mick was trying to get oh, them points for us. about that. And he completely that. closed the door on him, yep. Obviously, Jeddah, obviously as well. Um, we're talking about manipulation of driving in a manipulative way. Sergio Perez deliberately holding Lewis up in Abu Dhabi. D there's almost a lot of things the FIA have let run for a long time. So yeah. it felt like their response was reactionary rather than consistent. But I think sometimes yeah. you have to be reactionary I think you have in to light of the severity. Stop that stuff from exactly. And the FI mm. says, oh, we don't factor in the fact that there was an incident or blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, if he didn't crash, they wouldn't have given the penalty. So mm. I think, I think, I, I think it's a good penalty. I think going forward, let's just keep that up. Yeah. He, then he pretended that there was a throttle issue on the crew down that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> Listen up. Straight after when the VSC got released, he was pretending that the car had a throttle issue because he knew what he did was wrong. And he was like, oh, crap. Mm. Like, I, I didn't mean for him to go flying into the wall. And it's just like, let's say George got seriously injured, yeah? 
like seriously seriously injured would we still be having this discussion no we wouldn't so yeah one of those things man one of those things but it, you know what i like that situations like that create so much debate and and talking points yeah. and perspectives you know and some people would yeah, just say yeah. ah, alonso did nothing wrong and personally i think most people would say that it, it was it was a bad move. It was kind of unsporting yeah. and, you know, not worth the risk that it potentially put George in. So thankfully, like we mentioned, yeah. George is okay. He will live to fight another day. And, you know, I think with Alonso now, the craziest thing is, I think when you say no to Alonso, he comes back with even more crafty things to do yeah. or things yeah. that are outside yeah, of the white lines. And to be fair... At some point, all the greats have done done it. Michael Schumacher has to be one Everyone of the biggest does it. Everyone does guys. It. Everyone, that... Michael Schumacher's wide moves are a bit insane, and people seem to forget that. But you know what? Let's not talk about Michael Schumacher. But everyone's done mm. it. Everyone does it. Everyone does it. If you think you can get away with it, you're going to do it, aren't you? At the end of the day, so true. It, it is what it is. But that was just that corner. Maybe not the best place to do that. Fair. Fair. Mixie said, uh, Lewis, uh, I remember this. Lewis was cl was very clever with this. Start of the Belgium Grand Prix, probably back in 2019. Ferrari, or 2018, this is when I think Ferrari still had their legal spicy engine. And Lewis had qualified on pole, but then Sebastian had got a run out of La Source, up, yeah. you know, um, Orouge. And Lewis yeah. backed out of the throttle to stop uh, Seb Vettel from getting the slipstream through yeah. the Camel Strait. Into I, the yeah, I, that, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say Lewis did the exact same thing. Same I wouldn't thing. Say no, that. Lewis, that was that was that was tactical defense. Alonso in mm. this situation, this wasn't tactical defense. It was so defensive. It was almost offensive. It was like Alonso mm. was trying to do something to upset Obvious. the balance, not just like mm. tactically. Like what Lewis did is akin to there being a DRS line, you being next to someone, and then lifting off so they cross mm. the DRS. So you cross the DRS line behind them. That but, is like yeah. what Lewis did. So yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's the exact same, but I understand where they're going with that. Sure. Now, you know, we've been cooking up a storm here, Tommy, man. It's been a great episode. You know, I, I haven't mm. done a podcast in a while, but this one has got me back in my in my in my zone, bro. So thank you. But bro, we got a honey badger to cook here, bro. We got a, a rare oh, Australian God. delicacy to put on the grill. Oh, because man, 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 bro, man, man, oh man. Ma don't don't revive him, bro. It's not Call of Duty. Don't try and revive this think, guy, um, bro. He's... I think what has happened with Daniel Ricciardo has to be... It will go down as one of the biggest fumbles in Formula 1 history because he was mm. doing fine at Red Bull. No, he no. had a good car and he was doing fine and it was masking all the issues, masking all the problems. And then he got a tiny bit too big for his boots and now it's biting him. I think the decline in his stocks on the f1 grid has been monumental and i think this is something that we will continue to talk about for like generations where it's like this person was renowned as one of the like some of the checks he was getting before he was top three like best paid drivers paid. on the grid and mm. now he's gone from being a reserve driver to being a second driver getting bullied by someone with less experience and now there are rumors that he's going to get replaced with a rookie which is insane Ooh. but i think this uh red red i think red bull don't really care to be fair they see him as a marketing they don't. A, a marketing person they see toro mm -hmm. rosso as a marketing brand it's to them they don't care about performance at toro rosso so i think they don't really care so uh, yeah but i mm -hmm. think from our perspective it is comical I feel bad for him though, because I don't want to think what this would do to your mentality or to your mindset. But um, at the same time, well, it is a colossal, colossal bro, mistake. Bro. Look how the mighty have fallen, bro. Like it's yeah. crazy because Daniel Ricciardo, you know, pre 2018, 2019 had the chat for people like Lewis said, yeah, I yeah. could bad Lewis up. I just bad it up better. Who? Who? Yeah, man, let me come and, and swing one out like a kangaroo in a kangaroo yeah. park, fam. Man, man was on smoke. And then, like you mentioned, takes that deal at Renault. Again, I also kind of lost respect for him too, because man ran from for Max, you know. Man didn't want the yeah, smoke from Max. From the challenge, but I heard that the relationship between Max and Christian was going like really weird, where like they moved mm. in next to each other and like they were traveling together and doing all this stuff. So I understand yeah. where you're like, well, if I haven't got a place in this team and I was here first, I get it. But at the same time, mm. 
you kind of ha if you want to be the guy you don't run away you show people why they should respect you and unfortunately true he didn't so i yeah it's it's a shame but again wow um what can i say it is what it is he is the 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 artist of his own demise so yeah true man f1 black said he fell off like gel off it's crazy bro it's yeah. crazy um danny rick's driving style doesn't suit the new cars migsy i hear that and that's probably true I but it's not Dan an excuse his driving style hasn't suited a car since the red <laughs> race, so let's not keep making Bro. that excuse for him he true. Uh, yeah let's just let's not keep making that like i don't know what's you know, going on with him he had that one kind of glimmer in um the mclaren monza which again wouldn't have happened if max hadn't taken lewis out but sheer luck that he won in monza let's be real absolute mm. sheer luck a anyone in that position would have won he didn't win based on merit he won because of luck in that situation and i'm not like a person that's like oh yeah luck 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 but yeah mm. nah it's fact story if max and lewis hadn't come together oh well, you know what i'm trying to say subliminally if, Ma if max and lewis didn't come together then that yeah, wouldn't yeah. have really been the outcome but again 2021 was a mad season um it's over for danny rick go to america listen colin don't 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 try and take him over to america man we got indycar man we we, we live in nice out here man we don't want him over here in the states he missed that <laughs> market because he, he could have gone to indycar and i still think he was even afraid of the challenge there because tommy will yeah. like it's funny that this was mentioned because i've got a bit of american stuff to talk on lightly as we bring this uh podcast to a close but yeah i think even in indycar you would get duppied by the likes of Pato Award, yeah. uh, Joseph Indy Newgard, Car, and all those guys. I think IndyCar is light work. It's actually not light work. Um, look at Roman Grosjean. Uh, <laughs> absolutely not doing anything Cooked. at all. So, yeah. Facts. Um, Junior, I love this as well. Junior always comes up with the positive points. It's time to see Lawson cook. Absolutely agree with you, my, my guy. Absolutely agree. Lawson. Lawson should have got that seat. Ages ago. That's the thing ages ago so yeah man just one of those things um danny rick is a joke always has been true man's always smiling like he's sponsored by colgate and there's nothing to smile about in his career now i'll tell you that mm. so it's this facts this facts right so tommy another early morning start for you bro if, if you didn't like suzuka, australia then you know i saw suzuka was next i was so discombobulated i thought I, that was a mm. glitch Suzuka predictions, Red Bull one and two, and let's say third will be McLaren. That's what I'm going for. I don't Ooh. know why I've chosen McLaren. I've just said McLaren because I have no faith in Mercedes, unfortunately. Uh, Lewis is Fair. good at Suzuka, though. Lewis is good at Suzuka, but Suzuka, you need high speed and good downforce. downforce. Two things Mercedes don't mm. have. So, um, yeah, I'm going to say uh, Red Bull one, two, McLaren third. You know what? Ferrari third. Let's go for Ferrari. Let's be realistic. So that's what I'm going to mm -hmm. go for. But it's going to be yeah. an interesting race. We'll see what the weather does in Suzuka mm. because Suzuka can be... Especially this time of year as well. I am yeah. not really like it this time of year. But usually when they do it, it's like monsoon season. But um, yeah. hey, let's see what happens. Uh, another early start, like you said. What what I've got my app here. It starts at 6 a.m. Not too bad. That's when the race starts. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens. Oh, no. Fair? Oh, yeah, 6 a.m., thank God. Yeah, so, Six. yeah, let's see what happens. Perfect, man. Well, I'm not. I'm going to throw that question to the uh, audience as well in the chat. Guys, you've been amazing as well. Engagement in this episode has been strong, man. We need to get Tommy here more often because man's bringing that energy and vibes. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, you guys have been sensational too. Make sure that you guys add your predictions in there too whilst I segue into the next question before we wrap this up. So, um, Tommy, you know, you know, you're a very well motorsport esteemed enthusiast. I'm sure even if you didn't watch it, you might have heard the rumblings at the weekend that there was an exhibition race in IndyCar for the first time in 2012. Yeah. Uh, essentially, yeah. um, they went in, to... I'm, uh, in, so I'm just letting you know. But yeah. All right, we, we ain't going to cook you like that. But I'll, I just wanted I'll, to get really... two, two thoughts on, on, a, on a little concept here. Because uh, IndyCar... Wait, was it, was it the yeah, thermal club. Oh, so, just for those track. who don't okay, know, I know thermal. Yeah, yeah. Thermal's oh, a private bro. members club. So, thermal club is a private bro. members club for drivers. They have their own track. You can go there and drive around. You can live there as well. No, you can live at thermal. Bro, club. there's like little houses. yes, yeah. You see how bougie this guy is. See, see this guy, bro. <laughs> Let me come in and get bro. 
Look at this guy's living his best life. Man knows ins and outs, but Tommy nail on the head. And for those who didn't know, yes. So IndyCar ran an exhibition event. There was no points on offer. However, the twist was there was over a million dollars on the line. And it was basically broken down into uh, a, a heat. So there were two 10-lap races of drivers. Only the top, I think, six from each of those heats would make it into the final. And so then like, the uh, NASCAR playoffs kind of. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then essentially the top winning driver would win, I think, half a million dollars for themselves and the team. And then it kind of prorated from that point onwards yeah. up until like P six or, or, or seven, where I think it was like a share twenty three K, which for these yeah. teams and drivers, that's light work. Um but bro, just like Tommy, I wanted to get your perspective on this, man, because I think unfortunately the format let itself down in terms of the racing there was basically one soft tire so the race was 20 laps but it had a 10 lap period then a 10 minute break and in that 10 minute break they were allowed to change the soft tire and it was like the ultra soft of firestone tires so then yeah, there was another 10 lap race 10 minute break at, pff, bro, Americans, they go get the sponsors in. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, before it was NFL, bro. <laughs> Even though there was no touchdowns. But, hey, well, Roman Grosjean got a touchdown, but like, listen, let me not, let me not cook the Phoenix too much because he's got his fans out there too. Anyways, um, there was another ten lap race on the same, like basically cheese soft tires, and there had been drivers that in the first ten lap race had been going twenty seconds off the pace just to preserve the life of the tire on a, on a Lewis thing and see if they could yeah. work their way up the, f- the field. And the other drivers, like Alex Pelow, uh, S- Scott McLaughlin, uh, had just it's gone at a constant it. pace and just basically yeah. went for it. In the end, yeah. the guys that basically just kept a constant pace walked it. However, That's the guys true. that were at the back did yeah. actually manage to get themselves up in and around the midfield for P4, P5. So out of 12 yeah, cars... Thing- yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting concept. One thing I always find, yeah. though, is that saving the tires, people, is good in theory, but you still have to overtake. So Take cars. I always, mm-hmm. I always wonder when people are like, save the tires and we'll get them later. Will you get them later? It's not easy to overtake. Um, but yeah, oh, that's an interesting concept. Indy is a world that I'm not familiar with, but mm-hmm. I like how everyone's trying to make motorsport more appealing to a mass audience and it's clear that's what they were doing there and i feel like a uh, formula one could learn from this they do sprint weekends which no one really cares about instead True. let's get and i've said this idea now since they started talking about sprints let's get the sprint weekends or the sprint races put your third driver in the car one car per team and just bomb it out for 15 laps and i don't need i don't need any of this 20 lap 25 lap bs i just want a quick 15 laps bomb it out, see what happens. If they wreck the car, they wreck the car. That's their L to hold. But that, I would watch that because I reckon you'll get some good racing. And then what you do as well, you do um, qualifying, like maybe 30 minutes before, 20 minutes before, mm-hmm. hot lap, bang, 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 bang. It will spice things up. That's what we need. True. But True. yeah, what do I know? I'm just a lowly viewer. That bro, the system has it a different way, my guy. And that's half the issue addressed there. But I agree with you. That would be so exciting. And in a way, you're seeing a similar kind of format, although it has its own agenda, with the F1 Academy. And these lovely, yeah. very talented young women that are going out there, they're endorsed by, you know, proper F1 teams on the grid. And you've got the likes of Dorian Pin, a very established sports car driver that's now mm-hmm. getting into open wheeler. It's mashing everybody else mash up the place like jay huss it's mm-hmm. crazy you know so to see if they could do that but with the third drivers which should be getting seat time in the car and would also give us another perspective and eyes on the sport i think you yeah. hit the nail on the head there tommy so great we're gonna go through a couple of comments in relation to predictions and maybe some other comments in relation to the the thermal experiment so uh mix said max domination you hate to see it. <laughs> um, it is another year. It is what it is. True. Uh, McLaren, McLaren will be quicker than Ferrari there. Ooh. Could be. We'll see. At, McLaren we'll not see, the ball. Can, yeah, they can do. But likewise, well, even in, I, I also, you know, Tommy, you made a really good point in terms of Suzuka being a circuit where you need high downforce, but also top speed. I think, yeah. in a way, it, it's not identical, but very similar in aspects to Silverstone 
and also Austria, where you need high speed. Yeah, I would say the close, the closest to Silverstone. You have the S's, <laughs> you have the long straights, you have some tight corners. I'll say it's close to Silverstone in Austria, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'll just say you probably need a tad more downforce at Suzuka. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Mercedes don't have that, so yeah, yeah. Man, I'm not that. sure what will happen, but yeah. Um, Lewis pulling out Ocon slip street, <laughs> bro. Black, don't remind me, bro, because that was last year's race, innit? Where Lewis had mm. the, the very special helmet, and then yeah, he got into one with Ocon, and Ocon held his own. And I know you're uh, Ocon ambassador too, Tommy. So, quickly, bro, what's going on for Alpine and them, man? What's going on? Uh, I don't know, man. That's not my team, bro. They need to. <laughs> <laughs> Man said, don't Say mix me. P7, P7. P8. Yep, that's what we're expecting. They're going to, the car will be great in FP3. And then, oh no, the car will be great in FP2. Terrible in FP3. Then it's going to be downhill from there. Because someone loves to change things. Max domination by 25 mm. seconds. 25 seconds. I think more like 30 something seconds. But yeah. Hey, Malik. Yo, my, my guy, what, what's, your, what's your issue, bro? My forehead's looking healthy, bro. My, my, my forehead's not on the Rihanna or LeBron thing, fam. My hairline's looking crispy. Bro, you wish you looked like this in your, in your late 20s, bro. Hush up. <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, you're having banter with me. Black saying, money, money, money. Yeah, so that's going to be a thermal comment. Mick yeah. saying, Alex Polo won it. Yeah, and this is what I'm saying. Like, the talent pool in IndyCar is not one to be ramped with. Alex Polo mm -hmm. could probably smash... He would make Daniel Ricciardo look like a Lego racer. Like the way Polo could like race and be so yeah. smooth with his positions, manage fuel, manage tires and dominate a race weekend. Absolutely. Um, Colin saying, it's like the old Monza Grand Prix in the 50s. Not a bad idea at all, except it was badly executed and there was less than zero atmosphere. Yeah, there wasn't many fans on circuit either because it's an exclusive kind of boys toys mm -hmm. club. But again, from a marketing experiment, I get it. You know, I don't think it was a complete failure, although the format of the race was interesting, you know, in the way it came out. Um, what else have we got here? So it's a cliff, 11, 12, 30 minutes. Um, I wrote before about how I would revive non-championship races. Colin, definitely agree with you on that. It'd be fun. Junior drivers, winners get in seats. Love that. Monaco with uh 1995 spec chassis. Oh, classic races. All right, all right, Malik. So they can pass, um, and it's at their own cost, true. Even though I don't think Charles Leclerc would care about that, to be honest, man. Still bins cars at Monaco. Sorry, Tommy. Sorry. Um, I would rather see a reverse grid for a sprint race, yeah. Oh, I think please, it'd be interesting, but also the thought of it is a bit contrived. Makes me feel sick. What a, what a lazy, <laughs> not what, a, what a lazy way to spice things up. Uh, the thought, I, the, I don't know. It just sounds like Mario Kart to me. Fair. Fair. Until Pin did an extra warm down lap and got a 20-second penalty. Black, don't talk yeah, about my missus bad. like that, bro. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't just tell her. But her radio wasn't working or something? Probably your radio wasn't working, man. Like, it, it, it's... You know, for a lot of these drivers, it's new being in an open-wheel car like that. And yeah. things can go wrong. So, I... I it was harsh to see the FIA do it like that when people have got away with worse, not naming any names. But Dorian is a killer shark. I know she's going to come back and yeah. slap you. You know, I've also been watching Abby Pullin too, which seems to be the second other driver in contention. Uh, I'd hopefully hope to get her on the podcast that one day. But yeah, the talent pool in, in um, F1 Academy is, is spicy and one not to be taken lightly. Uh, McLaren will be super quick at uh, Sector 1, potentially. Georgina is laughing. Uh, Malik's hungry, bro. Of course, I said forehead, not your hairline. Play no, 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 no. They're connected, rude boy. Don't try and mix. Don't mix me, bro. Don't mix me. <laughs> your hairline is straight like the border of US and Canada, long and continuous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't come, bro. Don't fire shots at me, my guy. I'm here. I'm out here with a healthy hairline. And uh, Colin also say no reverse. We've had Colin on in the past, and he also was very reticent about reverse grids. And actually, the spinning sprints. So <laughs> Bro, F2 thing. I, I don't think so, you need a sprint race. Let's be real. You don't. Yeah. Just, it, it's just one of those things where they tried something and I think it's been there and, and, and done yeah. that practically. So, yeah. Tommy, we like to leave things on a positive note, though, man. Listen, I know, bro. I feel your pain. I can kind of see 
just that kind of ah, oh, this 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 grimy thing with F1. Might buy myself a GT3 car next week and compete in the British. Bro, I could see you doing something like that, bro. But um, yeah, man. Talk to us. Talk to us, bro. With future projects. Plans for the rest of the year. I, re- I already feel the year's gone by so quickly. Ready I'm, in April. I'm, I'm, it has it has sim racing, trying to be like you, but yeah, I'm yes! in sim racing just because it means I don't have to risk my own real life cars as much. Uh, I love racing. Mm-hmm. It's something that's almost instinctual for me. Like it's just ingrained in my DNA from a young age. So yeah, I just want to master my craft, get into sim racing, get into you know like, i racing. I really like uh, a seto a set of course. I really like Corsa, Corsa. yeah. Yeah, I really like a set of Corsa. Um yeah, just doing more of that and you know, yeah, then a tr- couple track days in the real world, but nothing too serious. But yeah, just you know, my plans this year just to enjoy and live life and just be a good dad. Bro, most important things, bro. Most important things. And bro, we're happy for you, man. It's good to see Thank a you. good guy like yourself flourishing. You've done it the right way, you've done it the authentic way, you know, and you're an inspiration to all of us kids out there, man, that wish to be like you one day, man. But no, honestly, like it's it. it's amazing. And bro, anytime you're doing some racing things, well, holla me, man. I know you're busy, but holla your boy yeah, to four C dens, bro. Don't forget about let's me. But yeah, man, like it's exciting. It's exciting that you know you, you keep renewing your interest in most sports in different ways. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing more episodes of as well of your car reviews. Those are amazing mm-hmm. too. Tommy, mm-hmm. where can our people find you? Uh, Tommy Auto, basically, on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. I think on, on Twitter, I'm still Tommy Music, or Instagram, I'm still Tommy Music. But yeah, Tommy Auto, Tommy Music. Tommy with an I and one M, because I am Nigerian. Uh, but other than that, um, I've had a great time being here, and I can't wait to uh, wake up early uh, <laughs> or in eight days to watch um, a rubbish race. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bro we just have to live through the moment man they say it's always darkest before dawn so uh, we just have to cut through the crap and eventually god willing we'll, we'll get some sort of spice when lewis goes to the red yeah. side but you know i want to shout out all, all the people that have been here as well i want to individually thank everybody f1 black man like you know migsy ferrari fan in here to fosi dens you know the hashtag man awesome podcast appreciate bro we love the love we love appreciate the support yeah. our history um you know specialist colin johnson big shout out to you uncle malik who is cussing me out on my uh, my shiny forehead don't watch that my guy don't watch that i'm shining b um you know georgina the boss georgina the boss yeah. thank you so much for the opportunity just everybody that's been inside here as well junior thank you so much a lot bro for coming in here and you know this Again, adding to the show. Without you guys, the show is not the show. And the show must go on. So, guys, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you like this podcast as well. Give us all some love. Go and check out Tommy's amazing content as well. You'll be absolutely flattered with the professional level of our content creation there. He's a yardstick. I wish to be in the future. And share this, you know, with all of your friends, all your families, all your loved ones. Share it with your hamster, man. Share it with your hamster. Yeah. But yeah, no, guys, been your boy, AMG Tafosi Dent. Thank you as, all, as always. Guys, also, I'm actually not done for the day. I'm going to be on my own channel, AMG Dent, doing a bit of, of uh, wrestling, surprisingly enough. Um, the kind of a combo track uh, combination on iRacing, for me, is a bit dead. You've oh. got GT3 cars around Portimao. You've got uh, F4 cars at uh, Road America. I, I, I racing isn't really ch- chatting to me this week after a very disappointing uh, Sebring 12 hour uh, event, which I won't talk about any further. So, if you want to see something a bit different, if you want to see some um, some cool uh, nostalgia and the rock and a couple of the old school guys and this new WWE game I'm going to be playing, make sure you head over to my channel too. But anyway, light plug, love and support as always, guys. Thank you for being here. It's been your boy AMG Dens and Tommy, and we'll catch you guys soon. Thank you so much. And...